Um, Tan, I can see that you are in um, the attendees. Can you check whether the attendees can access the chat and see if you can pop a message in there to everyone? Also, um, Noala, I think you should be able to message everyone on the chat section. There should be, if you click the blue, should be open to everyone. Thank you, Emma. Yeah, I can now. Thank you. <laughs> now everyone will be firing the messages in. <laughs> People are still coming in. I think everyone's settling in as well. Um, welcome, everyone, um, to our webinar on climate change. Um, thank you very much for attending. Um, as an icebreaker, please put your name and your year group um, onto the chat as well as um, your university. If not, um, if you're not a student, feel free to put pre-reg or pharmacist, um, whatever you feel comfortable doing. Okie dokie. All right. Um, okay, so for our participants, um, we would like to start with a Kahoot session. So um, if you can join our Kahoot by searching Kahoot, the website, and then putting in our code, this will be our code. I will share screen. Here we go. Dun, dun, dun. I see a Mecca second year student at the University of East Anglia, as well as the BPSA Eastern Area Coordinator. Welcome, Carmen third year UCL pharmacy student. Welcome Tanya, pharmacist, first year qualified and ex Cardiff university student, as well as BPSA vice president. Welcome Taz Lema, fourth year Aston pharmacy student. There's many people joining on Kahoot. <laughs> Great. Give it a few minutes. Has everybody who would like to join the Kahoot, join the Kahoot?
if you'd like to start, feel free to start in the chat and then we can go ahead. Doki, I will take that. Oh, okay, never mind. Are we ready? Okay, I will do a final countdown. Three, okay, five, four. Three, two, one. Okay, we're gonna stop. I should have joined. So what year will climate change be deemed irreversible if we do not act now? And the correct answer, which six of you have got, is 2030. Scarily close. Newbie, you're doing great. Oh. Okay, next question. Which of the following is not a cause of climate change? Yeah, so I could have read that out, my bad. Next question. Where will the 28th session of the Conference of Parties take place? This is um, a session where um, talks on climate change um, and, and sustainable uh, development and takes place. Difficult one, but the um, 28th session will take place in Dubai. Oh, newbie. I wonder who this newbie is. <laughs> By what year did the NHS commit to reduce the emissions it controls to net zero? Twenty forty. Well done, Evie. In the United Kingdom, greenhouse gas emissions from the health sector make up what percentage of national emissions? Three to four percent. Quite a bit. Well done, tea time. On the 1st of July 2022, the NHS became the first health system to embed net zero into its legislation through what act? Yep, so Health and Care Act 2022. Well done, tea time. Since 2010, the NHS has cut its carbon emissions by how much?
30%. Inhaled anesthetics can account for up to how much of a hospital's greenhouse gas emissions? So 5%. Propellants in metered dose inhalers account for approximately how much of the NHS's carbon footprint in care delivery. like I could put some music. 13%. Between 2030 and 2050, how many additional um, deaths per year are predicted to be caused by climate change? Bit of a tricky one, but um, it's predicted to be 250,000, which is quite a bit. The NHS staffing campaign launched at the same time at the start of COP26. It's called Healthier Planet, Healthier People. Is this true or is this false? So this is true. Well, oh, everybody got it right. Wow, fantastic. <laughs> so pressurized metered dose inhalers use in England is responsible for nearly 1 million tons of CO2 equivalent per year. Is this true or false? Yet again, true, scarily. <laughs> well done, Bobo. Out of all transportation vehicles, planes and ships emit the most carbon dioxide into the environment. Is this true or is this false? This is false. Heat waves can be associated with cardiovascular disease. Is this true or is this false? This is true. Welcome back, tea time. To preserve a, a livable climate, uh, average emissions per person per year will need to drop to two to two point five tons of CO two by twenty thirty. Is true or false? Is this true? Welcome back, Bobo. A year from setting targets in 2020, 
the NHS reduced its emissions equivalent to powering 1.1 million homes annually. Is this true or is this false? This is true. It is the NHS's ambition to reach an 80% reduction in emissions that they control directly by 2022, 2028 to 2032. Is this true or false? Two more questions, hold on tight. <laughs> This is yet again true. Using a refillable bottle for a year saves 64 kilograms of CO2 compared with single use plastic bottles. Is this true or false? This is true. In 2017, the NHS sent 15% of its waste to landfill. Is this true or is this false? This is true. Final question. Climate change drives health inequalities. Is this true or is this false? It's true. Well done in third place we have tea. In second place, we have tea time. And in first place, we have, drum roll please, Bobo. Congratulations, Bobo. And well done, runners up, Newbie and um, TV. I will stop sharing my screen. Oh, well done, Craig, for winning. Wow. Okay. Thank you very much to everyone who participated in that. Um, we are now excited to have Tracy on board. She is going to be your next speaker. Tracy Leons is a, a principal pharmacist medicines optimization and pharmacy sustainability lead with NHS Dorset um, Integrated Care Board. She is also the co-founder of Pharmacy Declares and has a specialist interest in fossil fuel divestment programs. Tracy currently sits on the NHS England uh, Medicine Sustainability Board and is an environmental advisor to the UK Clinical Pharmacy Association. Take it away, Tracy. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Thank you so much for the invite. Um, I've been to uh, quite a few events over the years where um, BPSA members have been in the audience and you have just been so enthusiastic and um, so positive. It's, it's just brilliant to be in the same room with everybody, even if it's virtually. So um, I will just try and share my slides now. Can somebody tell me, can you see that? Yeah, that's good. Oh, brilliant, thank you so much. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for having us again. Um, I really do feel that this is uh, exactly the kind of audience that um, you know myself and Nina and the Pharmacy Declares people want to speak to because you're so engaged. And I think just you know that Kahoot session at the start just showed how well researched you are and how well prepared everybody is coming into the session. Um, 
and we were asked to look at a few different things this evening, um, you know, to clarify the health threat from climate change, look at what's being done nationally and regionally for, you know, in terms of health and pharmacy, and then look at what BPSA members can do to tackle it. So we're going to break that down into different areas um, and try and answer all of these questions. Um, Nuda and I are going to sort of do a tag team thing, we're going to look at different areas. Um, and so um, if things aren't covered in my slides, they'll be covered in Nuda's. So the first thing um, I always want to cover is you know, just how serious an issue climate change is. Um, and this is something I took from Twitter a couple of days ago from the UN Secretary General. General and I think you can read the, you know, the sense of urgency in this message. Um, you know, and within Pharmacy Declares, we talk an awful lot about how to communicate with people about how to take climate action and to bring people on board and you know, we always think, you know, you always want to come with a sense of positivity because we're, we're working for such a brilliant cause. Um, but there's a part of me that really thinks actually we should treat this like a medical diagnosis. And we should be honest with people about how dangerous the situation is. Um, and the honest truth is that the climate and ecological crisis is going to kill people in the next couple of decades by the end of the century. Um, and what's up for debate now is exactly how many people will die and you know, what we can do about it. Because the positive spin is that there's so much we can do. We have the answers. But I think the, the changes that we need to enact are going to be mean a change to our lives. And in, in the same way that we wouldn't ask somebody to have surgery, to have a leg amputation or to have chemotherapy without explaining why and being honest with people. I think it's really important that we're honest, particularly amongst ourselves, amongst health professionals, about what climate change means for us. Um, and it's really important that we understand. So that's my first point is climate change is a serious issue and it's related to health, um, which I hope this slide shows you because the other little, I think, mental bubble that people need to pop sometimes is to think that climate change is um, an environmental issue that you can you know, put in the corner with anyone who is, um, you know, a tree hugger or, you know, um, a hippie or something. Climate change is fundamentally a health issue. Um, and that could be because of the direct effects of climate change, which are in the inner circle here. So rising temperatures, extreme weather, etc or it can be because of the indirect effects, which you, you can see on the outside of this diagram. Um, you know, and I'll cover a few of these in a minute, but you can see all of these are health issues. And so this is a, really, a point we have to crystallize and we have to understand climate change is a health issue. And so because we're health professionals, this is something we need to get involved in. And I can say that you know, right now in the UK, even when we think we're quite quite secure and we're quite safe here, aren't we? Um, every part of the UK will be affected by every part of this diagram and things will change. So that's why we have to act on climate change. And when we do, you'll have a bigger impact on health than you will on any other aspect of your career. It, the potential is absolutely huge. Um, and so I'm going to just run through a few of the things that climate change can bring to the UK and then relate them to health impacts. So this is a, a map of how the temperature in, in England and Wales might change over the next sort of uh, four decades up to about 2060. And I actually stole it from the National Trust um, because they were looking at the, the risk to their property portfolio. But you can see, you can look at this and see the, the temperature change that will occur over the next few decades and think about the number of homes and schools and hospitals that will be you know, in that patch. Um, and it's really significant. And because the temperatures will change, we'll see more heat waves. Um, you know, last summer we had our first red extreme heat warning in the UK, which means the temperature was a direct threat to life. Um, and as climate change progresses, if we allow it to, those heat waves will occur more frequently and they'll be more intense. And they really will affect the, 
the frail, the disadvantaged. You know, we spoke about health inequalities in the survey at the very start. Um, and it's for you know, people who live in inadequate housing, they, they can't escape the heat that surrounds them. Um, they'll become more and more impacted by climate change as it occurs. And for us in healthcare, um, <clears throat> it's gonna make our job particularly tricky. You know, um, nearly 90% of hospital wards are at risk of overheating. Um, and where I worked last summer, in some of the smaller rooms in the hospital, the temperatures were getting up to 40 degrees, which means, you know, the poor nursing staff um, were really suffering. They were making up um, medication in those rooms, which is an increased risk of um, destabilization. <clears throat> you know, and it's harder to look after the patients because they're so hot. We have an increased frequency of things like um, acute kidney injury. We had patients who were admitted um, in pain because their, their analgesic patches had sweated off. You know, it brings a new dimension to healthcare. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and the, the added complication that we saw this year was that it got so hot during the day that the main deliverer of, um, of medicines to hospital settings just said, I'm not coming in the afternoon. You know, they couldn't guarantee the stability of the drug, so they just didn't turn up. And that was across England. So these are the things that we're going to have to encounter as time goes by. As the temperature goes on, we're also going to have to think about, you know, whether we're at risk of seeing wildfires. Um, and when Nuda and I started this work, you know, a couple of years ago, we were speaking to colleagues in Australia and the west coast of America where heat waves were more prevalent. And they spoke about the need, um, you know, during hot weather to set up um, clinics for respiratory and burns because of um, wildfires. Um, and they spoke about how they had staffing issues because the smoke from the wildfires can travel for vast distances, you know, hundreds of kilometers and make it difficult for people to breathe. And that's with or without pre-existing respiratory conditions. Um, and the first few times I gave this talk, I always had a picture in the background of somewhere like Australia or the Amazon rainforest. But this picture I, I have here is actually of a, um, a really, well, it was of a really unique, rare wildlife reserve that's very close to my hospital, very close to my home. And you can see it's absolutely scorched and you can see how close the fire got to um, the houses and there's a school just beyond the edge of the picture. Um, in, you know, and the, the fire chiefs council have actually said, you know, this is a British issue now, so this is something we will see more often. The other um, health related risk that we have to think of if we have prolonged periods of high temperature is the impact on our, our ability to feed and hydrate our populations. Um, and the UK Environment Agency's chief has said actually, if things continue the way they are, the UK will run out of sufficient drinking water to keep people safe and healthy by 2045. So that's not very long. And you have to think, you know, how are we going to deliver the, the brilliant healthcare that we can and we, we do offer if we can't keep people hydrated. Um, we also might see um, patients who aren't able to get enough food because of food shortages. Um, and we have in the UK and in Europe, this amazing network of food suppliers that sort of back each other up. But increasingly the National Farmers Union is saying that crop failures are occurring now because of the changing of the environment and the weather that we're seeing in summer and in winter. Um, but just to put it into perspective, one of my neighbours is a farmer and last summer he had to water his crops three times um, a day and at night just to keep the soil soft enough so that he could um, you know, take out a food crop and you know, bring it to the market. Um, and the, the graphs, if you can see them on the right hand side, show you that as the, the environment has changed, the, the production of the, the staple food crops that we rely on to feed everybody globally has dropped. And this is because of climate change. Um, and uh, this is one that's really close to my heart. This is fossil fuel air pollution. So this is arises because we're burning fossil fuels and um, which are causing the climate change, but they also impact us directly 
through this invisible um, effect on the air that we breathe. And every year in the UK, um, nearly 40,000 people die of fossil fuel air pollution. Um, you know, it's nearly one in 20 deaths in the UK. Um, that's more than HIV, malaria and TB put together. Um, and I think for a lot of the time, you know, we just accept this because it's invisible and we're so worded to our cars and, you know, we're like going on holiday, we get like going on planes. But, you know, as health professionals, we would never accept this if it was smoking or if there was this was caused by, you know, gun deaths or something like that. So we really have to, you know, break the bubble and realise that this is such a serious thing. Um, and the other thing, even when you're talking to your other health professionals, is that people often think of air pollution as just a, a respiratory, uh, uh, it just has a respiratory impact, but that's not the case. It has this top to toe effect. And if I was going to direct you to some reading, uh, the chief pharmaceutical officer produced a report um, not long ago on air pollution. And there's a summary document that's really easy to read and it explains exactly what we need to do. Um, and the other thing I would direct you to do is look at the air pollution around you because um, you know it's not just a problem in inner cities, although that might be where it's worse. This impacts almost everybody in the UK. Um, and what I would say to you is, you know, go out and look where you live, where you work, you know, can you hear cars? Is there a lot of concrete or glass or metal? Those are the places that are likely to have a problem with air pollution. Um, if you go out and you see green space and trees and grass, they will protect you. But anywhere you have a preponderance of cars and the urban environment, air pollution will be a risk. And so we have to think about, you know, what are the impacts of driving people into our healthcare services? You know, if we tackle fossil fuel air pollution, it will be a, a monumental success in the way that we look after our patients. And then, you know, we've done all of the hot things. I just have to mention the wet and the cold as well. Um, because like uh, the, the heat waves, as climate change progresses, we're going to see more storms that are going to be more intense and last for longer. Um, and I don't know what anybody's seen where you live, but um, down here in Dorset over the last few months, we've had an immense amount of rain. Um, and this is the change in the weather pattern caused by climate change. Um, and where we have the, the rain, we've had flooding. You know, um, on Monday, I couldn't get to work because the road um, was uh, blocked by water. Um, and this is going to be aggravated by sea level rise because the, the polar ice caps are melting. Um, you know, and when you have ri um, risen seas and storms, the flooding becomes more intense. Um, and this will impact more of us as time goes by because as a species, you know, we like to live by a city. Um, and in England, the Environment Agency has said that by 2080, um, over 100,000 properties are at risk of flooding um, because of this. And that includes health infrastructure again as well. Um, so nearly 10% of GP surgeries and about 7% of hospitals. Um, and there's a, there's a piece of work going on with the Environment Agency where they're trying to calculate exactly how many community pharmacies will be at risk as well. So, um, you know, in, in hot temperatures, at least we can turn on the air conditioning. So if we have it, you know, we can shut the door, we can escape it. But there is no possible way you can work around having the, your, your home or your hospital flooded. Um, and, you know, this picture of the ambulance always really strikes me because there's no way that ambulance is looking after people. Um, and the, the picture at the top is of a hospital in London that was actually evacuated um, the year before last because of climate change flooding. So it was the first time we've actually not just turned people away from a hospital, but had to evacuate the patients there because of it. So, and this is a, this is a graph I like to show people or a chart taken from a resource called Climate Central. Um, and they have mapped where the flood risk will be in 2050. So um, I live in Bournemouth. You can see slightly to the right of the screen um, I work at um, Paul Hospital, which you can see kind of in the middle to the left. You can see 
how close it is to the flood zone. Um, and uh, my husband works in the area called Arn. I don't know if you can see just across from Poole. Um, that's a nature reserve. And they're talking about how to um, turn that into an island, how to get people there when the sea level rises. And it's not just, you know, the coast. This is London. I don't know if anybody lives there or has relatives there. You can see that, you know, this is hundreds of thousands of people um, you know, in homes and hospitals and schools. All of this is going to change, you know, and even the big financial powerhouses like London are going to be affected. So that's the, you know, that's the, the delivery of the, di of the possible diagnosis, the prognosis, and you've given someone, you know, the news that could be quite shocking, um, but hopefully it makes people realise you think, right, this is really important. Um, and the process that I went through when I discovered all of this, it was actually, I say it was a bit like falling in love, you know, because you've had this terrible diagnosis, this terrible news, but you look around you and you see that the, the world around us is absolutely exquisitely beautiful. And it gives us everything that we, you know, we need to stay healthy, we need to stay happy. Um, you know, it doesn't matter whether the thing that you love is jumping into waterfalls, you know, in under a moonlit sky, or whether you love Netflix and cocktails or going to clubs or gigs or what have you, everything that we love is reliant on a healthy environment. And so if we look after the health of the planet, it will look after us. And that's a really important message that we can hold deep within ourselves when we go about our work, you know, particularly pharmacy practice. Um, and it's not just me saying this, you know, really elite organisations all the way around the world are saying exactly that. Climate change is severe, but if we act on it, this is the single greatest opportunity we're going to have to look after people. So this is something we really should seize. We really should take this opportunity and make a change. So what's going on nationally in the health system? And the good news is a lot. This is where we can really make a difference. So, uh, you know, as we said in, the, in the, um, the poll at the start, the Health and Care Act have now embedded into legislation um, that all NHS trusts and ICBs have to meet net zero targets and have to tackle air pollution. So there's, there's absolutely zero chance that anybody can say to you, um, tackling climate change at work, it's not part of your job. It's baked into what we have to do as health professionals. And this is a really key message to get to people, that if we tackle greenhouse gas emissions, we reduce um, sick patients, we reduce hospital admissions. Um, you know, so the, the message is climate care is healthcare. You know, there's no getting away from it now. Um, and if we remember that, we can always see the link that pharmacy and climate action and health, they're all wedded together. There's no separating them. Um, but the role for pharmacy is really, really clear. So we spoke about the carbon footprint of the NHS, which is you know, just under 5% of the UK's carbon footprint. And you can see that medicines, if you look at the two sections where these arrows are, make up a quarter of the NHS's carbon footprint. So if ever there was a time for pharmacists to get involved in um, climate action at work, this is it. And everything that's being organised nationally within the NHS has been run by an organisation called Greener NHS, which you can, you can see their logo in the bottom right hand, bottom right hand side there. Um, and I was asked to cover the, the main work streams that Greener NHS are looking at. And there are three different areas, really. The first one was to look at anaesthetic gases, which make up about 3% of the, um, sorry, which make up about 2% of the, the NHS's carbon footprint. The first thing they did was look at desflurane, which is an inhaled anaesthetic. Um, and it's a really nasty drug. It's about 50 times more harmful to the environment than another drug you can use in its place called silverfluorine. But the amazing news this week is um, the greener NHS have said, actually, we've been working with our anaesthetic colleagues and by early 2024, we're gonna phase this out of use of uh, NHS England sites. 
it's going to be gone forever. So this is absolutely phenomenal. And for anyone who's still a student, it means you might never see this drug, which is just brilliant. The other thing that they're looking at is reducing the climate impact of a, a gas called nitrous oxide, which is used um, in maternity, in dental work, in um, A&E, those kinds of places, um, because it's a, it's a potent greenhouse gas drug, has a terrible effect on the ozone layer, you know, and um, we found actually that most of the, the drug that's having this horrible impact is just waste. Um, there's a, uh, a, a toolkit designed by a pharmacist, uh, also a member of Pharmacy Declares, who has said, who allow people to look at the, the drug that they're using and to um, eliminate the waste within their system. Um, and most hospitals are finding that they're actually wasting or losing about 95% of the product they pay for. So, you know, really big changes going on here, really positive news. The other thing that Greener NHS are looking at is respiratory care, because, you know, as we mentioned before, the, uh, the uh, respiratory inhalers with little gas canisters contain um, greenhouse gases. They're bad for the environment. Um, and we know in the UK that we can safely switch a lot of patients onto inhalers that don't have um, those greenhouse gases in use as um, propellants, um, and we can improve patient care at the same time. So um, the, the focus on respiratory care has actually been an amazing success story because not only are we looking at how to improve the, the carbon footprint of the drugs that we use, it's focused care on you know, the respiratory illnesses of our patients in a way that I've never seen in my practice you know, of 20 odd years. Um, and if you have a patient who's better controlled, they're going to um, need less healthcare, which will result in fewer carbon emissions as well. So it's a really fantastic picture, but this is something that you can get involved in wherever you work, you know, up and down the country. Um, and the last thing that the big work stream that they're looking at is NHS procurement, which, you know, might seem quite dry at first, but actually from an environmental point of view, it's massive. About 62% of the NHS's carbon footprint comes from things that we buy, including drugs. And to get that down, Greener NHS are actually working with all of the pharma manufacturers and suppliers and getting them to reduce their carbon footprint as well. So it's a phenomenal piece of work that's being looked at from all over the world. You know, we really are world leaders in this area. Um, and I don't know if you can see on this graph, but by April 2028, Greener NHS have actually said that they want a carbon footprint for every drug that the NHS purchases, which is just going to change the landscape of healthcare across the world. Um, you know, and uh, once we can do it for drugs in the UK, it means that it will change our, our decision making in terms of formularies, nice decisions, all sorts of things. So, this is something to be aware of and monitor as time goes by. This is what we're aiming for. It's going to be revolutionary. Um, so what else can you do in pharmacy? There is an awful lot. So Greener NHS are gonna be working on these big work streams, the carbon footprinting, et cetera. But the, I guess the message that I want to get across to you is that you don't need to wait for Greener NHS to make a difference. So any activity you undertake in pharmacy, which reduces the need for healthcare, whether that's um, therapeutic drug monitoring, whether it's patient counselling on how to take their drugs, et cetera, et cetera, that can reduce the carbon footprint and the pollution associated with healthcare, and that's climate action. You know, and we have some reference sources for the carbon footprint of various types of hospital care on the screen. And so you can see if you can help patients take their drugs and avoid any one of those or move them down the line, you can see that um, you can uh, have an impact on the carbon footprint of healthcare. Um, and this is just a, a nice little fact that I, um, I found when I was looking at some nice documents. And they've said, actually, if we just implement the medicines optimization guidance, this is what it will save in terms of um, environmental impact every single year. Greenhouse gases, wastewater, production of waste, etc. 
And this is by really simple processes like taking a proper drug history, making sure patients are on the right dose of their drug, etc. So, you know, greener NHS are doing these big, important projects, but never underestimate what you're doing on a day to day basis. All of this is climate action. And then the last thing I was asked to look at, which I'm going to do a bit and then hand over to Nuna, is, you know, what can you do outside of work? Um, and the key message here is to know that the, the Venn diagram of, you know, climate action and your um, in your personal life and your professional life overlap because you're a trusted healthcare professional. And what you do um, professionally and what you do personally will act as a standard bear for the people around you and that will have an impact on the climate crisis. So very quickly, these are the things that I recommend if you want to make um, a, an impact outside of work that will reduce emissions, which will reduce the need for healthcare, which will look after people. These are things I would do. Um, I would move away from fossil fuels wherever you can, whether that's in your bank, your mortgage, um, anywhere else, any other organization that you belong to, ask them, you know, are they attached to fossil fuels? Do they have investments? I would look at your diet and go plant forward. I would move away from uh, fossil fuel driven engines as much as possible and I would consume less because you know we really need to reduce the amount of resources we're taking out of the environment around us and then we need to look after the you know the wildness the greenness of the world around us and whether that's by um, you know planting a window box whether that's reforestation on your hospital site all of it will make a difference and look after you know the environment so that it can look after us. Um, and I'm going to stop there because I've reached my 25 minutes um, and just hand over to Nina. That's great. Thank you very much, Tracy. I'm just going to share my slides, hopefully. So are you OK? Can everybody see those? Yeah, we can see. Brilliant. OK. So hi, everybody. Um, I was just going to pick up from Tracy and start by kind of introducing myself and telling you a little bit about my story because it's stories that engage people in the climate conversation. And one of the things we'd really like you to come away with from today's webinar is knowing that individual action is really important. Yes, we need to have much bigger sort of strategic government action, but we need individual action as well. And as pharmacy professionals, um, we have a really um, potentially strong and powerful voice, and so we need to be using it. So I wanted to kind of talk you through my story first, and then my um, background is primary care and education. So my focus here is really education um, and what's available to you guys as students and sort of what's going on at university level. So what you might be interested in getting involved in um, on a professional level. So as I say, um, I've worked for many, many years in both general practice and in education. Um, I joined Pharmacy Declares um, just in September, 2021. It feels like a lot longer and it's an amazing organization to be a part of. Um, I currently work for the Centre for Pharmacy Postgraduate Education in the Primary Care Pathways, and I've recently taken up a post with the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare. Uh, I have two teenage daughters, so this stuff really matters not just to me, but because I have two kids that I want to have a future for. Um, and I just love big, wide open spaces. I'm from Ireland originally, and that's a picture of a beach in northwest Donegal, which is just the most beautiful place on earth. So my kind of climate story, I guess, when action really started was actually during lockdown. I'd been interested in this stuff for many years and had kind of, you know, been through the cycle of sort of doing things, getting frustrated, stopping doing things, feeling guilty and sort of going around in these circles. And I think during lockdown, it really came home to me how important, you know, people and places are to me. I wasn't able to go to Ireland during lockdown, obviously, so I wasn't able to visit all those lovely big open spaces that I love so much. And that made me think, actually, we really need to protect these because these places are really important to our just our mental well-being. I also had lots of time to listen to podcasts and things. And I listened to a TED talk by Catherine Hayhoe. Um, and she said the most important thing that you can do about the climate is to talk about it because there's a socially constructed silence around the climate crisis. Um, and that really got me thinking about where I have a voice. And I'd really encourage you to think about that too. We all have a voice and we have a voice in different places. 
you know, that might be within your sort of family or friends, it might be within your university, it might be within different sort of organizations or groups that you're part of. And when I really thought about this, the place that I had the loudest voice was at work. Um, because I work in an organization of about 200 people that provides education to um, pharmacy um, across England. So I started in a simple sort of staff meeting talking about this stuff and why it was important to me. Um, and it sort of hit a chord and lots of people um, were interested and kind of said, yeah, I feel the same and I'm really worried and I would like to do something. I'm not sure what I'd like to do. And we formed a group initially. We formed a little WhatsApp group. Um, and then that grew into quite a big WhatsApp group with more than 100 people in it. And then kind of people higher up the organization wanted to get involved. So we created a Teams channel. Then I was asked to go and speak at the national meeting for the organization, which at that time was online. Um, so I went along to that and sort of it all kind of grew from there. So cutting kind of really quite a long story short, in the course of 18 months um, at CPP, we went from the picture in the top left hand corner. And this was a word cloud that I created from um, a poll I did at that national meeting where I said, describe in one word how you feel about the climate crisis. And you can see most people worried, concerned, sad, frightened, helpless, um, a really sort of negative sort of feeling where people just felt they were unable to do things. Um, and because so many people were interested and so many people were motivated to do something, we were able to sort of um, get lots of traction and get lots of sort of action going. And that started with little things like on a WhatsApp group and people sharing ideas um, and sort of sharing resources and signposting each other to things. Um, and it sort of moved right up the organization. We were really lucky because we were pushing against an open door and the sort of leadership level of the organization were really engaged in this. Um, but over the course of the months, we've kind of the 18 months, we've moved to embedding sustainability sort of into the day to day business of um, CPP. So thinking about sort of um, our staffing structures. So we have a regional sustainability link in each area, putting it into our procedures. So making sure sustainability is on the agenda and on the day to day procedures um, having an environmental statement. Um, and introducing policies. So we have vegetarian food at all our face-to-face -face events now. New members of staff don't get an iPhone anymore. They get a fair phone, which is um, replaceable and much more ethical than most of the other phones. The little picture on the right is a picture of one of our conference tables. So we no longer long bring loads of leaflets or sticky notes. Everything is QR codes because we're trying to sort of reduce our paper use. And sort of picking up on the talking about it theme, so I wrote an article for the PJ, which is the one on the left, about everything we did at CPP, and my fabulous colleague from Pharmacy Declares wrote the article um, on the right, Wendy Tyler Batts, so she works in general practice, and she had a similar journey to me in general practice, so we both thought it would be a great idea to write about it. So if you go um, to the pharmaceutical journal, they now have a green pharmacy section and all of their um, articles that have any sort of relation to climate action or climate change or sustainable healthcare are all in that section. So a really good little resource of articles to go away and read. So kind of um, at CPP, we're now kind of um, thinking about staff engagement. We have lots of ways of engaging staff on sort of fun levels, WhatsApp groups. We have little social groups. We get involved in community things like litter picks and what have you. And we were actually awarded one of the University um, of Manchester Social Impact Awards last year. We've embedded things into our processes and policies. So people are thinking about this all the time now. So when we're creating new content so new booklets, you know, people are thinking, well, does it need to be printed or can we do it online? If it needs to be printed, you know, can we reduce the amount of paper that we're using? So everybody's thinking about this all the time, which is really where we want to be. Communication is obviously really important up and down the organization so that people can spread their ideas. And also if there's policy change that can be um, disseminated throughout the organization. And then we have made a sort of um, pledge to update our program content and design. So this is really, really important that we're starting to embed sustainability into the pharmacy education content that we produce. So for example, we've updated some of our programs around um, asthma and inhalers um, to align with what Trace has been talking about in terms of the um, greenhouse gas emissions from inhalers. 
um, and we've also created um, a whole learning gateway page on environmental sustainability. So this is a really good starting point if you're thinking, oh, I'd like to know a little bit more, I'd like to look some stuff up, but I'm not really sure where to start. Um, this just sort of signposts you to some really key resources that hopefully will get you started on that journey or um, help you if you're doing some work in this area. So you're probably thinking Centre for Postgraduate Pharmacy Education, that doesn't include you, but you'd be wrong. So we now have a section for undergraduate students on the CPP website. Um, so if you go onto our website, just click on the orange developing your career tab and there's a section there for students. And not all of the content is available to students, but you can access the learning gateways so you can get to that environmental sustainability learning gateway um, and have a look at what's on there. I believe there's also a section on the BPSA website which talks about how you can access um, CPP uh, materials. Of course, there's loads of really useful clinical stuff on there as well, but I'm just focusing on the climate stuff today. So at this point, as I say, my background is in education, so I'm a really strong believer in the fact that knowledge is power. If we don't know the stuff, we can't really do anything about it. So I'd really love to just hear from you all in the chat box. Can you tell me yes or no? Does your pharmacy curriculum cover anything to do with um, sustainable healthcare or the health impacts of climate change? Have you come across that at all in your pharmacy curriculum? I'm really hoping there's going to be some yeses. <laughs> but there's lots of no's. But that means there is potential. There is potential for you guys to do something and to get this onto the agenda. We've got one yes so far. Yay, yay to the yes. Now we want to know where, where the yes is. <clears throat> Aston. Oh, excellent. Actually, maybe. OK, great. So possibly maybe. So maybe something for you to go back and ask. And one of the things we're going to talk about is, is, is again, your individual power as students um, to challenge and to ask questions and to push. Um, OK, great. We're getting a few yeses in. So that's fantastic. So some of you know, some of you yes. Um, at the moment, there's no requirement for this to be on the pharmacy curriculum, but we are working very hard um, to change that. So. This just shows you a little bit of an infographic of um, lots of the resources that are out there and you can just Google any of these um, and you'll find lots of information um, around sustainable healthcare, about the health impacts of climate change um, and various different projects that you can get involved in. So Tracy mentioned a couple of key documents and if you're interested in knowing about the health impacts of climate change, I would really direct you to this health warning report. Um, it's the Climate Coalition report, and it focuses on the health impacts of climate change in the UK, both now and in the very near future. Um, and it's sobering reading, but as Tracy has sort of pointed out, there are sort of really key impacts on the health um, of the nation um, here and now. And I think this is an area, um, certainly in my experience, that patients and the public are generally not really aware of they're not, they're not really getting what the health impacts of climate change are and how it's affecting them day to day. And to me, I think this is a really potentially very strong lever for us to engage with the wider public and get them on board because health is something that everybody ag um, agrees on. Everybody wants to be healthy. Everybody wants their family and their kids and their parents to be healthy. Um, and if they understand you know, the really significant impacts that the climate change is going to have on their health, I think more people will be engaged to sort of take action um, and do things. The thing is, lots of the things that we want to do around reducing the impact of climate change naturally lead to better health. So if you eat less meat and you eat more plants in your diet, that is actually better for your health. It reduces your risk of heart disease. It reduces your risk of a range of cancers. It reduces your risk of diabetes, of obesity, a whole range of things. So actually by engaging with a greener lifestyle that inevitably leads to a healthier lifestyle as well. Um, and there are so many positives and health opportunities to be had um, from addressing the health impacts of the climate change. <clears throat> so just sort of directing you to some of the other resources that are available um, on the eLearning for Health website, which is a Health Education England website, 
This is now available to students where it wasn't until really quite recently, but you can now register on the eLearning for Health website using your university email address. Um, now it's open to students in, um, in England. I don't know if we've got any students from the devolved nations here. Um, I'm not sure if it is available to you. Um, but there is, um, there's three little short 30 minute online modules on here, which have been developed by the Center for Sustainable Healthcare. Um, so if you just Google e-learning for health, environmentally sustainable healthcare, you'll get to this page. It will ask you to register um, and then you can access these modules. And they're a really great resource for just sort of getting your head around um, the basics of the impact of climate change. Um, and then there's also, it also will signpost you to lots of other resources around things like air pollution and the impacts of air pollution. So lots of you have said that there's nothing on your curriculum around this. Um, and I know certainly when we talk to academics um, in pharmacy schools, some of them will go, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not an expert on this. I don't know where to start. I don't know where to teach it. I don't know what the resources are. So for you guys, I would really encourage you to go out there and find these resources, talk to your lecturers. And if they're not familiar with these resources, you know, signpost them to them. And because we're all on a learning journey, you know, nobody's got an evidence base for this. Nobody's got years and years of experience for this because we're dealing with it day to day. Now, I was going to talk about the Planetary Health Report Card, which is an amazing project, but Ellie's here and she's going to talk about it later, so I don't need to. But this is just an amazing um, piece of work, which started off in medical schools and is now in pharmacy schools. Um, and I'll leave Ellie to explain it, but I think this is a really fantastic way for pharmacy students um, to get involved in getting their schools of pharmacy to assess themselves against these metrics and look at, you know, how are they doing? And that also then gives them sort of an action list of things to do to make things better. And this covers everything from what's included in the curriculum, right down to, you know, what is the campus like in terms of sustainability? And this is important, you know, not just in terms of sort of the climate um, impact that it will have, but also for universities in terms of their, um, um, you know, people wanting to apply to them. So my eldest daughter is applying for universities at the moment. And one of the things that we look at is, you know, what are the sustainability scores of these universities? What are they doing? Um, because I want her to go and live in a place that cares about this stuff over the next three years, because that's actually really gonna matter. Um, you know, so there's wins there for the university um, as well as for the climate. But I'll let Ellie explain that to you in a little bit more detail. So Ellie, of course, is a member of Pharmacy Declares as well. So another amazing group that Pharmacy Declares has put together, and this is um, one of my amazing colleagues, Mina I, has put together a group of pharmacy academics. So this group, which has been going for just over a year, now has representation from almost every single school of pharmacy in the UK, which is just amazing. Um, and we have a meeting every couple of months and it is the most positive, go get them, do stuff meeting that I go to in my whole life. I just love it so much. Um, so every school of pharmacy has somebody on the staff who's interested in this and who is doing work in the background about this. So if this is something that you're interested in, go talk to your lecturers and find who's interested. So some of the pieces of work that this group is doing is working firstly really, really hard to get sustainability as a requirement in the curriculum in UK schools of pharmacy as it is in the medical undergraduate curriculum. But we're also a group um, who are really interested in sort of sharing what we're doing, um, sharing resources and um, working together um, on ideas. Um, so lots of good work going on there. So one of the things that that group is doing is encouraging their pharmacy students to um, include environmental sustainability and sustainable healthcare in their projects in third and fourth year. Um, and what we're doing at the moment is sort of collating those projects and where possible getting them presented um, at conferences, at posters, what have you. So these are just some of the ideas of student projects that are happening at the moment. Um, so again, there's a really great resource there in terms of a group of people um, who are pharmacy academics who are involved in this. Um, so again, if, you're, if you have lecturers who say they're not sure where to go, please direct them to the Pharmacy Declares website. Um, there's a section on the website on education and all of the information about this group is on there because we're really happy to welcome as many more members as we can get. So then you might be thinking, well, I don't really know anything about sort of sustainable healthcare and how do I introduce that into my learning in pharmacy and where does it fit in? And, you know, I just don't really get it. Um, and it can seem like just a really huge, big topic. 
Um, and this is where these principles come in. So the principles of sustainable healthcare were published back in 2010 um, by Frances Mortimer, and she's the medical director of the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare. So um, this is a charity who do just a huge amount of work around um, encouraging the adaptation of sustainable healthcare within clinical practice. And this is a really nice framework of four simple things to think about when you're thinking about patient care that align with sustainable health care. And actually, when you think about it, a lot of what this is, is what pharmacy do anyway. So the number one principle is prevention. If you can prevent the disease in the first place, then that is the most sustainable way forward. And as we were saying earlier, things like active transport and a high plant-based diet, those are things that prevent disease in the first place. Um, but obviously, you know, a person in their 50s or 60s who has no high blood pressure, no heart disease, no diabetes, um, eats a good diet, isn't overweight, exercises regularly, they have a much less demand on the health system than somebody who is morbidly obese, has type 2 diabetes, has hypertension, is probably heading for a heart attack, can't get to work because, you know, they're sick all the time or having to go to appointments, is getting depressed because they can't get out. So you can just see, like, just looking at those sort of simple things, the massive difference. So prevention is key. And of course, community pharmacy plays a huge role in prevention and um, with healthy living pharmacies um, and public health campaigns. The second one, second one is um, patient empowerment and patient self-care. And I mean, this is where we are at. Um, with pharmacy um, promoting shared decision making. This is about patients understanding their condition, understanding their medicines, getting the most out of their medicines so that they are in control of what's going on and they know what they're doing. They understand when to use their inhalers or when to step up or when to um, change things. So if you have a patient who's engaged and informed and is using their medicines appropriately and knows when they need to access health services and knows when they can self-manage, not only is that a more sustain a sustainable approach to healthcare, but it's probably a happier um, patient who feels more in control of their care and more in control of their health. And again, this is what we're doing all the time in terms of medicines optimization. Lean service delivery is around um, being efficient. And again, if you think about what we do as pharmacy, you know, we're all around sort of um, efficient services, efficient monitoring, efficient repeat prescribing. Um, it's what we do as our, as our kind of bread and butter, certainly in general practice. And then low carbon alternatives is looking like thing, at things like um, alternatives to inhalers, low carbon inhalers, um, and as, Tracy was talking about once we get that carbon footprinting data, we'll be in a much better position to sort of make changes on that front. So those are four really simple steps that you can think about. So when you're doing your case studies or when you're doing your clinical learning, you know, think about those and ask questions and, and challenge your, your lecturers and go, you know, well, you know, instead of, for example, a really good example is um, the recent NICE guidance, the consultation is out around primary prevention and they're thinking about lowering the threshold at which they prescribe statins um, to people to less than 10% risk. So my question would be, well, okay, do we throw a lot of money at prescribing more medicines for people with a lower risk or do we try and encourage those people to live a healthier lifestyle so they don't get to that risk in the first place? So it's kind of just throwing a bit of a curveball in and thinking, well, if we spent more money on making sure people had access to, to green spaces, making sure people had access to decent food, would that actually be better than spending a lot of money on medication that might cause side effects that people might not take that will cause pharmaceutical pollution? It kind of goes on and on. So this is a really good example of sort of looking at these four um, principles of sustainable healthcare. And this is from Frome Medical Practice, and they have just done huge amounts of work um, on sustainable healthcare and they're part of the Greener Practice Group. And if you look down the right-hand side, you can see sort of they put in some ideas that link into those frameworks. And you can see these are things that as pharmacy professionals, they're the sorts of things that we can get involved in or will be um, promoting um, in any case. So just something to kind of think about and maybe go away and have a look at those um, frameworks and see how you can apply them to your sort of learning day to day. The other thing that we look at um, at Centre for Sustainable Healthcare is thinking of sustainability as a domain of quality. So when we're thinking about healthcare traditionally, we think about, you know, is it safe? Is it effective? Is it person centred? Is it cost effective? But actually what we need to also be doing now is thinking about is it sustainable? 
Um, and this is something that you can think about if you're doing sort of quality improvement projects, um, and you might be doing these when you're on placements, you can think about incorporating sustainability into your quality improvement project. So instead of just looking at, for example, um, financial savings, you're also then looking at, you know, is there an environmental saving? So uh, if we're using less medication, that has less impact in terms of carbon footprint. It has less impact in terms of pharmaceutical pollution. Um, social impact, it might mean the patient is um, not having to come back and to so many appointments for drug monitoring. So it just makes you look at things in a slightly different light. Um, so again, it's a really good sort of little framework that I'd suggest that you think about using if you're doing any sort of quality improvement projects um, within your um, academic work. Okay, and there's loads of free information on the SUSQI website around how to do sustainable QI projects. There's a little step-by-step -step guide. Um, so there's lots of resources that you can go and look at and that are freely available on that website. Um, so think about this in relation to your fourth year projects when the time comes to do that. Um, think about how can you introduce a sustainability aspect into your project, because as well as perhaps making that interesting for you, if that's something that you're sort of interested in, interested and passionate about, it also then gets other people to think about it, because the other people that you're working with on that project will think about it. Your lecturers who have to mark it, it will make it come to their attention. Um, and it's just talking about it and spreading the word and bringing it into our day to day practice. Um, and the website is there for you to go and have a look at. And um, for those of you who have time on your hands in the holidays, um, there are volunteering opportunities with Centre for Sustainable Healthcare. So if you want to come along and learn more um, and do a bit of volunteering, that's actually how I ended up getting involved with them in the first place. So I would really encourage you in your sort of, um, if you're already qualified or already working in your pharmacy practice, or for those of you who are still students in your learning, is to try and look at everything through that sustainability lens and think about how can I link what we're being taught here, what we're being asked to do um, to these principles of sustainable healthcare? And that then hopefully will create opportunities for you um, to develop your own learning, but also to start those conversations um, around sustainable healthcare and the health impacts of climate change um, and to start sort of pushing for change and to just bring this into the conversation as part of the normal conversation as we would now with sort of efficiency, effectiveness, cost effectiveness, that sort of thing. So Tracy gave you some really great tips about what you can do um, sort of in your day-to-day -day life. Um, and here's some ideas in terms of your um, student and professional life. As Tracy said at the beginning, you know, we're so pleased to be talking to you guys because you really are the future. Um, and I think it's really important that you use your voice as students, um, you know, as the pharmacists um, of the future generation. And, you know, make sure that your pharmacy schools are aware that, you know, this is something that you're passionate about and you want to learn more about. And the, the potential for pharmacy to make a difference in this is absolutely just massive, really. Um, so things like the um, planetary health report card, which Ellie will talk to you about, there's a great opportunity there to get involved. Um, do push to get sustainability into your curriculum if it's not already there. You know, ask your lecturers, you know, why are we not covering this? This is the biggest health crisis we are ever going to face. You know, how can you possibly get through a pharmacy degree and not talk about it? Um, you know, and encourage everybody to, to look at those resources and um, educate themselves. So definitely, you know, educate yourself, use those resources um, find out more, ask more. And if you're interested, um, join us in Pharmacy Declares. It's an amazing group of people and um, professionals and students who are all doing just amazing pieces of work. And it's so lovely to be in a group of people who are like-minded and passionate about the same thing because it really provides support and motivation. And um, so if you feel like you're sort of out there on your own, um, it's a really great way to kind of get support and keep moving on. So, so find your voice, wherever you have a voice, please use it find your tribe find people who kind of feel the same way as you who can work with you can support you you can do stuff together and um, ask questions you know get those conversations started don't worry about doing things perfectly we just need lots of people to start doing stuff it doesn't need to be perfect and then you'll find once you start doing stuff and getting involved in action then that's just a much more um, hopeful and positive place to be so please do have a look at our website. There's information on there about how to join us um, and these slides will be made available to you. So hopefully you can access all of those resources. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Noala. Thank you very much for your presentation and thank you, Tracy. Um, Noala, it was amazing to see your growth in climate change um, action and especially over um, the period of COVID as well to see your growth. It's, um, it's amazing and um, really showing that um, if you want to take action, you can definitely take action and get involved and it can be something small as well. Um, so as I really liked how Nuala said, how can you introduce sustainability into your project? So um, you can definitely get involved, um, whether it's a small change, for example, cha um, not drinking from um, plastic bottles and using a refillable um, bottle, etc. Um, Tracy as well, thank you very much for your insight, wonderful insight. Um, something that really strikes me as well is um, when you said the farmers struggling with um, um, with their crops, um, you know, farmers are our direct um, relation to food resources, essentially. And as demands grow, there's going to be um, larger food systems. So more production of food and more wastage in landfills. Uh, landfills. And of course, um, because of that, there's going to be greater greenhouse gas emission. Um, now, that's quite a cycle so to consider that food wastage is also a massive massive contribution to um, greenhouse gases is um, a bit scary as well um, another thing is um, I remember the last drought in the UK that we had was in 2010 2012 ish and as a child already that was impacting me but to then see that um, in Tracy's um, presentation we saw that um, we could possibly run out of drinking water by 2045. Um, um, considering we've just started 2023, that's 22 years. So that's 22 years until we don't have water to drink. Um, a life, you know, an essential to us will not exist. Um, and that's, if we do not want that happening, we need to make changes and we need to make them now. So. Um, like Tracy said as well, um, any activity which reduces carbon emissions, as well as the need for healthcare, is a climate action. So, um, our lovely attendees, please um, do your best and let's make an impact on the environment. Um, a great way that you can definitely get involved is um, becoming a part of the Planetary Health Report Card, which um, Ellie, are you up for discussing, talking about right now? <laughs> Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I'm going to just share my screen. Okay, so hello. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, and yep, I'm here to briefly talk about the Planetary Health Report Card for Pharmacy. Um, thank you as well, Tracy and Nuda, for your talks. Um, yeah, they were just brilliant. Um, my name's Ellie. So I'm a newly qualified pharmacist working at Nottingham University Hospitals, and I'm the lead for the Planetary Health Report Card for Pharmacy. So this is a student-led initiative which aims at determining the amount of sustainability and planetary health consideration and um, inclusion within pharmacy schools and their wider institution. So the goal is to both celebrate uh, where it's included and also highlight areas where it isn't. Um, and as was shown in Nuna's talk, um, where there was lots of no's regarding planetary health teaching, um, you can see there's still a lot to be done. So, as I hope that you're aware, and as you've um, seen tonight in the Kahoot questions, and um, as Tracy and Nuda have discussed during their talks, climate change is a critical factor in global health outcomes. And until very recently, this wasn't acknowledged in healthcare education. Um, despite the fact that the World Health Organization um, stated that climate change is the single biggest health threat facing humanity. Um, so a couple of years ago, the Planetary Health Report Card was set up in medicine to address this, um, and the aim was to inspire their institutions to make change, both to run more sustainably as a university, but also to equip the healthcare workforce to work sustainably as well. And as healthcare professionals, we are both on the forefront of dealing with detrimental health impacts caused by climate change. So as Tracy has discussed, um, extreme weather events, increased antimicrobial resistance and air pollution, just to name a few. 
Um, but also we have a duty of care to our patients to work to reduce um, the input which healthcare has into worsening climate change. Um, so for example, um, reducing the vast amount of, of single use plastic that's used in hospitals every day. Um, so the planetary health report card is carried out using metrics. So these are set questions uh, which assess five, five broad areas. So they are planetary health curriculum, research, uh, community outreach and advocacy, student-led initiatives and campus sustainability. So the students pick out examples of where this is included. Uh, so one of the questions, for example, in the metrics is, does your pharmacy school curriculum address the impacts of extreme weather events on individual health and or healthcare systems? And then it's graded. So if it's yes, if it does include it, then you get one point. Um, if it's no, it doesn't include it, then you get zero. And then if it is included, then you put examples of how it's included there. And you do this for all the metrics. Um, they have about 20 questions for each area. Um, and then, yeah, some of them have a few less, but yeah, <laughs> there's questions for each area. Um, and then we publish a summary report alongside the reports from medicine and nursing students around the world on Earth Day every year. Um, and the report has recommendations for universities to use. So one of the recommendations from our report last year um, was to approach clinical teaching with planetary health as a common theme throughout the core curriculum. And this will hopefully allow sustainability to be ingrained in pharmacy professional practice um, in the same way as person-centered care or antimicrobial stewardship. And the overall aim of the summary report is to inspire positive change and um, improve planetary health inclusion. Um, yeah, and then I've just got a link to the report here if you want to access it um, and find out a bit more. Um, I'll, I can also put it in the chat as well. I have tried the QR code, so um, hopefully it works. <laughs> um, yeah, so I know that when I first saw Tracy talk in 2021, so that's two years ago now, um, that was the first time I'd heard someone talk about planetary health. And I just felt so compelled to act and to try and make a difference. Um, so I'm sure after hearing Tracy and Lula speak, um, you're feeling very motivated. So it's perfect time to tell you that we're looking for PHRC reps um, from every pharmacy school and for students to get involved in the PHRC for pharmacy this year. Um, so if you're interested in getting involved um, in the PHRC um, and meeting and working with healthcare students from all over the world, uh, then please get in touch. And I'll put our contact details here. And yeah, <laughs> if you've got any questions, um, then let me know. And yeah, I'll put all the details in the chat. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ellie. Thank you very much. Um, um, I myself was actually a part of this team last year. Um, so it's really nice to see it um, getting spread and hopefully you too can get involved. Um, on the topics of how you can get involved, we've got a little menti session if you'd like um, to just hang on to the last 30 minutes of our webinar and be a part of that. I've posted the link down below. Um, please join and share your thoughts. Um, how after this webinar do you feel you can contribute to sustainable living and how you um, believe you can take make an impact? Um, yeah. Let me share my screen. There we go. Okay, so we've got cycle more, change my bank. <laughs> yep. Um, give up meat. Use reusable cups. Yep, for sure. Oh, 
I'm going to ask this question to our speakers as well, actually. Um, how can you, um, let's start with Ellie then. Um, what can you think of um, in terms of how can you contribute to sustainable living? Um, I think the theme of tonight is talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Got yeah, that's, that's so much the case, isn't it? I think, um, you know, I spoke to a colleague who worked with Nula at CPPE and they said, you know, everyone was was worried about it and, you know, wanted to do something. And it was just because Nula had her introductory session and it kind of gave everyone permission to do something. And then all the ideas started popping up and that's how they felt about it. But it just needed someone to take that step and, like, you know, just voice what they wanted to do. I think um, speaking about it as well, perhaps um, brings it more onto our table as opposed to um, the back of our heads. So definitely, yeah. Yeah, and it, I think it's something that patients are really engaged with as well, because if you give them a way that they can be more sustainable, you know, they're really, they are really keen to do it. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, they don't really make the link between their medicines and their health and sustainability so it's helping patients to sort of make those links and, and pharmacy is in a really good place to do that I think yeah but for me I'm, tr I'm trying to ride my bike more I have a really ancient bike <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get in the car less which actually is really nice when you do it apart from mm -hmm. when it's raining <laughs> can I just put one in the chat just because this is my baby but um I've put a, a website in the chat called bank.green and you can check who you bank with. Um, and, you know, people power has actually made a massive change over the last couple of years. It's led to great big organizations like Barclays and HSBC beginning to change their approach. And so even if you think, you know, like I'm getting paid NHS wages or I'm, not, I'm a student, just even talking to your bank and saying, this is why I'm changing my account because you invest in fossil fuels is like so powerful so important so yeah please check it out yeah. i actually couldn't think of anything i wanted for christmas this year so i got some of my relatives to change their bank for me for their christmas present <laughs> <Women everywhere. laughs> very good well that reminds me tracy of i've been listening to you know deborah meaden from um mm. End. so she does a podcast and um, the big green money show it's called because she's really yeah. sort of eco-conscious and she has on people from really big business and a really key message from that is that business will change if their customers demand it so when mm -hmm. they start getting letters and emails and tweets from just regular everyday customers going why aren't you doing this why aren't you doing that that's when they start to sit up and take notice so it, it, it definitely so so one of the people on that said i'm just going to complain more about stuff <laughs> you can do it constructively uh, yeah. but, but, but really I thought that was really interesting that actually yeah you, you need to just speak up as a consumer as a customer yeah totally like um, plastic straws as well when all, all of that was on social mm -hmm. media and then now they are no more <laughs> it shows yeah. the power of social media absolutely yeah So I see a few more on here. I see a uh, shower instead of baths, um, e-bikes and walking, reducing food wastage. We can definitely get uh, get involved with the PHRC on there, um, but I'll say it for you instead. Um, shopping locally and um, using public transport. I'll head on to the next question, if that is it for that. Um, now, what concepts um, support sustainable development? Um, by this, I mean possibly stuff like raising awareness, education. We talked about how um, talking about the topic itself um, could contribute as an action. Um, this might be a bit of a hard question, but um, um, please do um, jot down your thoughts. Yeah. 
SDGs. Is it just me who's clueless as to? So that's sustainable development goals, isn't it? There. I, I, I thought that, but then the S at the end is confusing yeah. me. Maybe, maybe it's goals. <laughs> Because quite a lot of the university align to those, don't they? I know University of Manchester does. Mm. And I'm trying to remember, are they World Health Organization? I think they're World yeah. Health Organization. Yeah. So they cover sustainability and sort of um, social equality and that sort of thing. Mm. So actually that kind of reminds me that the University of Manchester, um, they have a thing called 50,000 Actions. So most universities now will have some sort of a program or initiative mm -hmm. for the university as a whole to encourage staff and students to be more sustainable in a whole range of ways so kind of worth um finding out if there's something like that at, at your university because it gives you little tips and um, reminders you know so kind of encourages you oh take the jump i love take the jump that's really good you guys heard of that <clears throat> It's really, that's a really simple evidence-based approach to changes that you can make in your life. So they did a big study. I think it's the University of Leeds led it um, and came up with really simple changes. And they're the ones that Tracy's already mentioned um, about eating less meat, consuming less, changing your bank account. Um, but there's a whole sort of website and social media thing around it. That's a great one. I've just put it in the chat. In fact, there's um, a, a doctor who's really vocal about climate change and health, and he's taken spending his weekends, he's created a take the jump and spin the wheel. And he, he goes and hangs out in his local community and gets people to spin the wheel and see where it lands and talks to them about eating less red meat or getting on their bike or something or buying, you know, fewer clothes. Um, and that's what he does with his weekends. Wow. Um, I'll keep the mentee up on the screen. If anyone has any questions to ask our speakers, feel free to pop it in Q&A or ask them directly. Um, in the meantime, I would also like to mention that the um, EPSA do have a competition as part of our climate change campaign. Um, and um, we're doing so to raise awareness and introduce different ways to tackle climate change within the pharmacy. Um, uh, the topic is literally how can we tackle climate change within pharmacy? Um, I'll put a link below so that you can access more information on the poster. And I think that will be, oh, yeah, that will be enough for the Mentimeter. Yeah, I'll stop sharing. Thank you very much once again to our speakers. Um, thank you for our attendees. Um, we have put links to um, CPPE, the Sustainable Healthcare um, Centre, Pharmacy Declares, as well as um, Tracy's put a few for Take the Jump, the Bank Green. Um, please feel free to um, reach out to us, the BPSA, to reach out to Tracy, Ellie, uh, Nuala, if of course you'd like to get more involved. Um, uh, I know that it is um, end of January, so exams um, season as well. Um, and I'm just going to put a link down here for pharmacist support. Um, if you'd like any support and you're finding it a bit difficult to um, uh, face and um, uh, walk the journey of exams essentially. Um, I'd also like to mention that we have our upcoming unmissable 81st um, BPSA annual conference coming up. Um, it is an event where students debate pharmacy affairs which um, help shape the future of the profession. Um, meet renowned pharmacy leaders um, such as Tracy, Nuala, Ellie of course. Um, as well as students across the nation, um, as well as having a lot of fun. 
the conference will take place um, at the University of Portsmouth um, between the 10th and the 16th of April, so um, 2023. Feel free to reach out to your contact lecturers, to your head of school, of pharmacy, and um, try and get your tickets booked. Uh, so we can see you face to face. Um, Emma, our um, competitions coordinator has also dropped down below the link for um, the feedback form for this um, webinar. So um, please fill that out so that we can um, bring you more webinars and hopefully contents that you can enjoy and learn from. Um, that is all I'd like to say. Would our speakers like to say anything? Or even Emma? <laughs> Um, I just want to say thank you so much for having us. It was brilliant um, and we really appreciate the chance to come and chat to you. Um, if anybody would like to know anything further, please do get in touch. Um, but definitely do look at the resources uh, Lula gave you because they're, they're so easy to use. They're brilliant and they make everything really clear. But yeah, um, have a lovely rest of your evening. Yeah, thank you very much. It's been lovely to have the opportunity to come talk to you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you, thank you. Hope to see you in the future as well. <laughs> With that, I would stop recording.